Good afternoon. I'm Chris Fanta. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our Asthma Grand Rounds. This is the last program for this academic year, and I thought I might just take a moment to highlight some of the uh, uh, lectures that we're planning for next year, which I think uh, reflects some of the exciting uh, breadth and depth of clinical interest here at Partners Asthma Center, including uh, uh, as, uh, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, uh, T cell trafficking in asthma, uh, the role of mechanical stress in asthma, uh, a, a roundtable discussion of obesity and asthma, and some discussion of the overlap syndrome between asthma and COPD. So I'm hoping you'll mark your calendars and join us uh, in the coming academic year. Uh, but today we have a distinct uh, honor. Uh, Dr. Peter Weller has come from the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center to join us. There he is uh, division chief for allergy and inflammation and also for the division of infectious diseases. He's professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and he's a merit award winner for his, uh, from the NIH for the enduring and highly productive uh, research of his laboratory in the immunobiology of the eosinophil. And so we're happy to have him here today to talk to us about the uh, eosinophil and its role in the pathogenesis of allergic airway disease. Dr. Weller. Chris, thank you very much for the introduction and for the um, invitation to make a presentation. I would like to review some of what we've learned uh, that may be pertinent to the roles of eosinophils in the pathogenesis of allergic airway disease. We'll go back through some of the you know, early thinking of eosinophils and then some of the evolving um, understandings and then finally turn to, you know, some of the potential applications of therapeutics, notably an anti-IL-5 monoclonal antibody uh, in the therapy of asthma. Disclosures, I do have a disclosure to make and that I have been a consultant for GSK. GSK makes one of the anti-IL-5 monoclonal antibodies, uh, mepolizumab. We've used that in a part of a multi-center study uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, for patients with corticosteroid-dependent hypereosinophilic syndrome. And we have underway um, planning for a study sponsored both by NIH and GSK on the role of uh, mepolizumab in the therapy of the Churk-Strauss syndrome. So with that, I would like to you know, turn to a consideration of eosinophils. And if one goes back to this, one of these premier uh, immunology textbooks, Janeway's book, the single role that the eosinophil is given is a role in killing parasites. And I think that, as we'll see and touch upon a little bit, that story is not quite as simple as it might have seen before. And then we're dealt, we're left with the, you know, the dichotomy, you know, even if it's got a beneficial role in terms of anthelmintic uh, host defense, why does it seem to be a participant in allergic inflammation? And what are the mechanisms by which the eosinophil may contribute to allergic inflammation? So, one then, if we consider um, the role of eosinophils related to parasites, we also have to think about the role of eosinophils in asthma. And this is a cartoon that's probably 15, 20 years old, and it summarizes some of the potential roles that were then recognized for the eosinophil. One is, as you see in the middle, um, the eosinophil is a, indeed a rich source of an eicosanoid, uh, leukotriene C4. It also is a source of a number of granule-derived proteins, and some of these are the cationic proteins. MBP is major basic protein, EPO is eosinophil peroxidase. And the release by degranulation or other mechanisms of MBP can damage the epithelium. This was recognized back then that the cationic proteins and EPO as, a, as an enzyme could activate uh, mast cells, causing their production of leukotrienes and histamine. So this was a contemporary understanding of the role of eosinophils in terms of contributing to the pathogenesis of asthma as of about 15 years ago. So let's turn then back to the nominal role with regard to eosinophils in, in 
close defense. And as illustrated here, we've got a larval stage of a cystosomula with appropriate opsonization, antibody or complement. Eosinophils will gang tackle this critter, degranulate upon it, and kill it. And that, that happens very effectively in vitro. What's less certain is what happens in vivo, both for humans and then also in murine models. And I'll illustrate the, the, one of the findings with murine models as shown here. This is a group from the NIH, Helene Rosenberg. And Helene has taken mice, including two strains of mice that have genetic deficiencies in eosinophils, the so-called double uh, GATA and then the, the uh, transgenic fill mouse. And by different mechanisms, both of these lack eosinophils. And what these authors have done is take these two e eosinophil deficient mice and infected them with a parasite that causes schistosoma mansoni. And what they found was that there was no eosinophil dependent differences in um, granuloma number or size or in fibrosis. S finally, eosinophil ablation had no effect on worm burden or egg deposition. So overall, our indicator our data indicate that eosinophil ablation has no impact on traditional measures of disease. So in contrary to what one might have thought based on current thinking, the eosinophil and the absence of eosinophils did not predispose these animals to you know, a greater or uh, more, more intense infection with this parasite. And indeed, the authors went on to suggest that perhaps the eosinophil has an immunomodulatory function. And indeed, others have shown that. Uh, David Abraham has shown that eosinophils can serve as antigen-presenting cells. So in addition to other antigen-presenting cells, EOs have this capability. And work from our lab, including Haven Wang, who's in the audience, demonstrated that e uh, in mirroring models of experimental asthma, eosinophils likewise could f serve as professional antigen-presenting cells, initiating antigen-specific immune responses by T cells, trafficking to lymph nodes, and so on. More recently, there's an expanding recognition of roles of eosinophils in situations that really heretofore had been unanticipated. If we think of eosinophils prominent in host response to worms, prominent in allergic infections, what's coming up here are some recognition that eosinophils have interactions uh, with other cell types. And specifically, uh, Claudia Barrick demonstrated a role for eosinophils in the maintenance of plasma cells in the bone marrow. And this mechanism that eosinophils used is based on their capacity to secrete specifically two cytokines, April and interleukin-6. So here for this cell that's ultimately the innate immune system is a role that was here for really underappreciated. Eosinophils utilizing their cytokines secreted to act on other cells such as plasma cells. And that role is expanding. Um, here's a paper from Science in 2011 recognizing a role for eosinophils in sustaining um, adipose uh, cell alternatively activated macrophages. And again, as outlined in red here, the eosinophil is doing it by means of secreting a cytokine, specifically IL-4. <coughs> This story continues to unfold, a recent cell paper looking at uh, innate immune signals, uh, specifically eosinophils again secreting IL-4 that can activate the regenerative actions within muscle cells. So this cell is beginning to, on the one hand to have many more functions that ha really had not been appreciated in the past. And a lot of these functions are based on the capacity of the eosinophil to secrete cytokines. And then finally, one in a recent PNAS in press paper is again emphasizing the role of eosinophils in secreting IL-4 to facilitate liver regeneration. And what's, one thing that's interesting about this is the hepatocyte has the receptor for IL-4. So here's an innate immune cell secreting IL-4, directly stimulating hepatocyte regeneration.
Before moving on, I think one of the other issues we have to think about, especially if we're going to start thinking about targeting IL-5, is a recognition that a group of cells now referred to as innate lymphoid type 2 cells, neocytes and other names have been applied, are sources of interleukin-5. So before these cells were recognized, it was CD4 positive T cells that were pre the predominant source of interleukin-5. Now we've got these innate lymphoid cells as an additional source of IL-5 that can be stimulating eosinophils. So if we come back to a consideration sort of the cell biology of the eosinophil, and this is a picture of an eosinophil actually from one of my patients on the cover of this primer of JAMA. Um, and what is illustrated here are some of the specific granules. And it's well known that these contain the cationic proteins that we've already mentioned, major basic protein, eosinophil cationic protein, eosinophil peroxidase. What we have to consider, though, is where do these multiple cytokines that are being recognized reside, and how are they secreted with some specificity? And there's a wealth of cytokines, and some of them are listed here. And what's notable for each of these cytokine proteins is that they are preformed within eosinophils. So the cell does not have to be transcriptionally activated, does not have to translate to generate new protein. The, all of these proteins, when measured, are preformed within the cell. So as a cell, again, of the innate immune system, this is relatively unique in that it's got an armamentarium uh, or a catalog or warehouse of preformed cytokines. And the other interesting thing is these cytokines are largely stored within granules. So that raises questions. Um, are there differences in terms of the amount of cytokines present within uh, eosinophils from different donors? And this is work of, of Lisa Spencer's from our group. And what Lisa did is take donor, e e isolate eosinophils from a number of donors, six are shown here, and then assay their content of preformed cytokines. And as you can see, while there's some variations in terms of the content from one uh, donor to another, all of them had preformed cytokines um, of uh, the, the seven uh, cytokines that were assayed here. So again, eosinophils are a source of, of preformed cytokines. And if one goes on and does subcellular fractionation, where the denser granules are here, and this is eosinophil peroxidase, a granule enzyme, and then more buoyant uh, cytosol and vesicles are at the top of the, of the fractions. One sees that for each of the cytokines assayed here, there's preformed protein present in the granules. So IL-6, interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, IL-4, IL-13, all preformed proteins. Some of these will also be appearing in these lower density vesicular compartments, and we'll come back to that in a minute. If one stimulates cells, as done here, uh, looking at the distribution of interleukin-6 before stimulation or after interferon gamma stimulation, there is a movement from the granules into the more buoyant vesicular uh, compartments, and these compartments are what's going to traffic to the plasma membrane and release the preformed proteins. So diversity of, protein, of, of cytokines, a multitude of functions, which we'll come back to. So the question then is, how do eosinophils degranulate? And the mechanism of exocytosis, where the whole granule would go to the plasma membrane, fuse with the plasma membrane, disgorge its entire contents, does not seem like a very uh, wise way to uh, secrete cytokines. Moreover, it's not seen in vivo, except on the surfaces of large uh, parasite targets, these non-phagocytosable uh, or organisms like I showed at the beginning. This is not a parsimonious mechanism for providing selectivity of secretion of granule-derived cytokines or of other proteins. Rather, there are two mechanisms that we'll talk about. One is referred to as piecemeal degranulation, which allows for the selective mobilization of granule contents into vesicles for secretion. 
And the other is a recognition of that cell-free eosinophil granules can be released extracellularly, likely by cytolysis, and that these granules, as we'll see, remain secretion competent even when they're liberated and are free extracellularly. There's EM evidence for both of these kinds of processes occurring um, in, in vivo. So um, there's some reason to think that indeed they are uh, real processes. So piecemeal degranulation is as illustrated here, where when starting with granules that um, contain a variety of, of preformed proteins, and by new mecha mechanisms that still aren't understood, with appropriate stimulation, some of these vesicles can bud off containing predominantly specific cytokines. These vesicles traffic to the cell surface and release their, uh, their cytokines or other proteins. The morphology of the vesicles is as illustrated here and pseudo-colored in red, and we call these sombrero vesicles because they look like a cross-section of a Mexican hat. And these are long tubular vesicular structures that uh, are well uh, probably designed for the transport of some of these cytokine proteins, the transport from the granule to the plasma membrane. Shown here uh, is localization of interleukin-4, and this really illustrates the importance of the vesicular compartment in, in, um, in the transport. These cells have been permeabilized in a fashion that does not permeabilize the granules. And the granules are stained here with, uh, for CD63, a granule marker. So what's in red are the granules. And the permeabilization process has not penetrated the granule, but has allowed antibodies to interleukin-4 to get into the vesicular compartment. And the multiple small punctate green staining structures are all vesicles that contain IL-4 and are therefore you know, a preformed protein in a compartment that can be very, rather, rather uh, rapidly released uh, and secreted. And this is illustrated even you know, more prominently here. So piecemeal degranulation involves the transport of <coughs> proteins from the granule through vesicular compartments and enabling them to be secreted. And this is data, again, from Lisa Spencer, and demonstrating that human eosinophils with various stimuli can very rapidly and differentially release their cytokines. So here, using um, as a stimulus TNF-alpha, and these are three different donors, one, and then assaying a variety of different cytokines, one sees that for all three donors, TNF-alpha gives you sort of a rank order with its predominant IL-4 release, interferon gamma release, but little release of some of these other cytokines. In contrast, if one stimulates the cells from the same, same three donors, now with um, interleukin-12, one sees a very different pattern of release. Uh, again, it's a pattern that holds true for all three donors, IL-13, interferon gamma being the two major cytokines that are quantitatively released in response to IL-12. So the eosinophil clearly has preformed proteins, can differentially uh, release some of these. They're not all you know, rep released uh, together or in packets. Uh, and the mechanisms that lead to that differential uh, secretion really re remain to be uh, identified. What about the other mechanism we mentioned? That's cyt cytolysis. And cytolysis of an eosinophil allows for the release of free membrane-bound granules. And these membrane-bound granules are illustrated here. Here are some of the, the typical EM morphology of the granules uh, in the skin. And here at a light level, one sees the same, uh, these free eosinophil granules here, intact eosinophils. These have been recognized by individuals um, over a multitude of years, uh, most clearly recognizable when one does um, electron microscopy, because then one can see this, this signature appearance of a granule with its crystalline core. One can also see it at times with staining with, with specific dyes, or when one does immunolocalization for some of the eosinophil cationic proteins. You see punctate granules, say, containing major basic protein, that and those granules clearly are outside of intact cells. <coughs> 
So one of the questions is, you know, what's the functional significance of these? And we explored this, um, and this is work of Josie Neves and others, um, and demonstrated that cell-free granules, isolated by subcellular fractionation, proven to be free of contaminating membranes or other cellular components, when stimulated, could release their preformed proteins, such as ECP, eosinophil cationic protein. And shown here are granules stimulated either with interferon gamma or eotaxin, secreting in a dose-dependent fashion ECP. They'll also secrete other proteins, and if we look at two of the enzymes that are in the granules, eosinophil peroxidase and beta-hexosaminidase, they too are secreted in response to stimulation with either eotaxin or with interferon gamma. If these stimuli are working on cell-free granules, one would expect or hypothesize that those granules indeed would have receptors for both of these two stimuli, and indeed by flow cytometry and other means, we can demonstrate that isolated granules here stained with an antibody to uh, the interferon gamma receptor alpha, and here stained with an antibody to CCR3, which would be the, the uh, receptor for the chemokine eotaxin 1. Granules express these cytokines. To be even more certain of the topography of uh, these receptors, we assayed um, um, using antibodies specific either for the N-terminal or the C-terminal end. So the N-terminal end would be the end that nominally is extracellular, would, would uh, bind to eotaxin 1, whereas the C-terminal would be, quote, the intracellular um, uh, do domain. And as one can see here, the granules express um, receptors, CCR3, capable of binding to um, uh, eotaxin. Granules themselves, when stimulated, shown here with interferon gamma, can also differentially release their cytokines. So the three that we assayed here, this negligible IL-13, more IL-4, and even greater amounts of IL-6. And this, in many ways, mimics the kind of secretion that one sees from intact eosinophils, likewise stimulated with interferon gamma, where IL-4, IL-6, and to a lesser extent, IL-13 are being released. So there's a preferential staining or preferential signaling mechanism elicited, say, in this case, by interferon gamma that is leading to the secretion of some cytokines and not other cytokines. So the cartoon of a granule, within the granule, I've not illustrated, but there's actually a very extensive tubular vesicular system. So it's not just a uniform um, matrix inside. There are receptors that, when they encounter the specific ligands, uh, initiate a series of responses within the granule specific signaling cascades, and that leads to relocation of some of the preformed proteins and ultimately their release in vesicular compartments. So cell-free granules are really, you know, end stage, um, in some ways, cluster bombs of an eosinophil. The cell may be dead, but the granules live and, and potentially remain responsive within tissues. So an evolving story. EO functions are not limited to terminal effector responses. Rather, EOs are key players in diverse processes. So it's not just killing parasites. It's not just uh, um, causing damage to the airway with release of, of granule proteins and uh, eicosanoids. Relative concentrations of preformed cytokines within circulating EOs are well conserved amongst donors is a vast array of immunomodulatory cytokines and chemokines that can be very rapidly and differentially secreted from uh, preformed stores in the granule and through vesicles through a process of piecemeal degranulation. Then finally, as we've just touched upon, extracellular cytolytically released eosinophil granules remain secretion competent and are sources of granule-derived cytokines and other proteins. It's mechanisms that regulate the selective and differential secretion of the eosinophil-derived cytokines remain to be defined. <laughs>
So that's sort of an update on some of the understanding of the biology of um, eosinophils. What about if we move, move on now to a consideration of eosinophils and asthma? And I'm, I'm, I'll give Bill Bussey credit for some of these slides. He had uh, used them at, a, at an ATS symposium that we co-chaired. And you know, I'm building on what, what Bill has uh, prepared. So coming back to eosinophils and asthma, eos are a landmark of uh, allergic inflammation. Eosinophil mediators certainly can con contribute to the histopathology of allergic diseases, you know, whether one turns to the major basic protein, some of the cationic proteins as an eosinophil derived mediator, we, one turns to eicosanoids, or as we've emphasized, some of the cytokines that can be derived from eosinophils. They all have the potential to contribute to the histopathology uh, and the underlying pathogenesis of allergic diseases. In asthma, EOs are increased in the circulation, airway fluids and tissue, and often in proportion in relationship to disease severity. So all of these features would lead one to direct an attention to therapies that might target eosinophils, and in doing that, hopefully modify the clinical features of allergic inflammation and asthma. So if we review, Early in late phase reactions, the late phase reactions are largely lymphocyte, IL-5, Ronti's eotaxin driven, that then lead to an influx of eosinophils. So if we begin to think about targets that would get at the role of eosinophils, at least in, in chronic infl airway inflammation, interleukin-5 becomes a major candidate. Interleukin-5 is a cytokine that uh, quite specifically stimulates the production of eosinophils within the bone marrow, stimulates the release of preformed eosinophils from the marrow into the circulation, and then also acts on the mature eosinophil either in the blood or in tissues to sustain its viability. So it is, in, in the human, very specific for eosinophils um, in terms of its actions, so that potentially neutralizing IL-5 may have a benefit in terms of diminishing the numbers of eosinophils that participate in allergic airway inflammation. So with that as a background, this was a cardinal paper that appeared in Lancet in, in 2000 by Margaret Leckie. And she and her group looked at the effects of interleukin-5 blocking monoclonal antibody on eosinophils, airway hyperresponsiveness, and the late asthmatic response. And what they did is they rec recruited 24 patients who had recognized late phase reactions to an inhaled uh, allergen. They randomized these into three groups, a placebo, and then two groups that got differing doses of, of uh, anti-interleukin-5. And what they found is essentially demonstrated here. On the top part of the panel, one is looking at sputum eosinophils. And indeed, with a 2.5 milligrams per kilogram and then even a greater dose, 10 milligrams per kilogram, sputum eosinophils tended to decline. Not totally ablated, though. But what these authors emphasized was that when they challenged their subjects with inhaled allergen, the late phase asthmatic reaction was not at all different in those that received higher or lower doses of the neutralizing anti-IL-5 antibody compared to those that received the placebo. So this paper went as far to suggest that eosinophils didn't have a role in the late phase reaction, that uh, therapies targeted to eosinophils would not be effective in the therapy of asthma. And you know, this was quite earth-shaking at the time. A number of people accepted this quite readily. Uh, and uh, for a while, even NIH study sections didn't have any enthusiasm for funding research on eosinophils because, as shown by this paper in Lancet, eos didn't have a major role. A number of people, uh, Paula Byrne and others, questioned uh, how aspects of, of how this study was done, uh, and we won't get into that. Um, 
So, but nevertheless, this was a cardinal paper in, in the year 2000. Thereafter, I think, there's an increasing recognition, and some of it's summarized here, that all asthma is not the same, as, as we know. Uh, there are different uh, categories of asthma. Those with mild or moderate asthma tend to have minimal sputomyosinophilia. Those with more severe asthma have more prominent sputomyosinophilia. So perhaps it's this population that would be most beneficial um, in terms of targeting eosinophils as an adjunct to the therapy of asthma. So if eosinophils are to be targeted, you know, what are the outcomes? And this is a study not using anti-IL-5, but rather using uh, uh, inhaled and at times oral corticosteroids. And this study was designed to evaluate whether inhaled or also at times oral corticosteroids that were given based on the speed of eosinophilia would be more effective than a standard guideline therapy uh, as used in, in Britain in the management of asthma. And the results are summarized here. So BTS is the British Thoracic uh, society and individuals with asthma that were, re, were managed by conventional BTS guidelines had exacerbations as charted here. In the sputum management group, the, uh, the ES level of eosinophilia was monitored in these patients and the aim was to keep the, the eosinophil level less than 3%. So if it got up the, up greater than, than, than 3%. In addition to conventional therapy, these individuals received increased inhaled corticosteroids or at times, if needed, oral corticosteroids. And a result of that, one can see significantly less numbers of uh, exacerbations in those who were attention to suppressing the eosinophil number was a guide to the therapy of the underlying asthma. This is a more recent paper um, in the New England Journal of Medicine where, again, the anti-L5 antibody, mepolizumab, is being used in the treatment of uh, refractory eosinophilic asthma. So this is uh, identifying a group of patients um, who are known to have sputum eosinophilia. And they're also um, uh, refractory both clinically and in terms of their, their uh, sputum eosinophilia despite aggressive anti-inflammatory therapy. The groups that are studied are shown here. About half received mepolizumab, half received a placebo. And by the various measures, they're really not significant differences. Um, severe exacerbations per subject, averaging you know, five a year, for in, essentially in both groups. Eosinophil count in the sputum, six to seven percent versus almost six percent. Blood eosinophil counts, very comparable. Inhaled corticosteroid doses, uh, rather substantial for both of these uh, individuals. And over half in each of these groups required um, oral uh, prednisolone. So the outcome, um, part of the outcome is shown here. Post-bronchodilator post FPV1s really did not dig differ significantly between those who received the placebo or those who received the mepolizumab. The impact, though, was on exacerbations. And as shown here, and these are individuals that received 13 doses every four weeks of mepolizumab. And then the number of exacerbations were charted. And those that received placebo had significantly more exacerbations over the 12 months than those who received mepolizumab. So again, in this, in this group with difficult to control asthma, with demonstrable pre-existing sputum eosinophilia, uh, mepolizumab was uh, effective uh, in terms of diminishing the numbers of exacerbations, the clinical exacerbations. What about this study? Um, again, even more recently in Lancet. And this is again looking at mepolizumab uh, in eosinophilic asthma and it's evaluating three different doses versus a placebo. It's a large, multi-center study, 621 patients, 81 centers, all adults, all with uh, two or more exacerbations of asthma. 
demonstrable sputum eosinophilia greater than 3% and a blood eosinophilia of greater than 300. The recipients of the meprolizumab, as would be predicted, we're now looking at the eosinophil counts. One receives in the placebo, eosinophil counts remain at their pre-existing level. And those that received increasing amounts of meprolizumab had suppression of the blood eosinophil counts. <coughs> not totally, it's not ablated, uh, but it is uh, significantly suppressed with each of the doses, tending to be greater with those that receive the highest doses of this agent. One looks and at, the, at the sputum eosinophil count. There's also a suppression of the sputum eosinophil count. And again, it's, it's a dose-dependent suppression being greater in those that receive the highest concentration of uh, the mepolizumab. So if we come back to exacerbations, uh, in this study, they defined, they defined exacerbations of worsening of asthma requiring oral corticosteroids for three or more days admission to a hospital or a visit to an emergency room and the various criteria that were involved. And the final conclusion of the study really is illustrated here. Again, we're looking at uh, the number of clinically significant exacerbations as defined as I mentioned, visit to the ED, admissions, et cetera. And looking at the period over 12 months, those who received the placebo, many more exacerbations, those that received mepolizumab um, had the best number of clinical exacerbations. So in these studies, there's accumulating evidence, I think, that at least if one targets the individuals who are candidates to receive mepolizumab, there is adjunctive clinical benefit to mepolizumab um, in some individuals with um, asthma can diminish their exacerbations, and exacerbations in all these studies are, the, are the, really the measures that have been considered here to date. So it's a, it's a clinical measure. It's a, you know, a failure to control one's, one's um, underlying um, asthma. The variables that are associated with the benefit to mepolizumab, uh, some baseline peripheral blood eosinophilia, an exacerbation in the previous year, so it's somewhat difficult to control disease. Um, and then we can turn to another study, now not tar specifically targeting um, the eosinophil, but uh, omelizumab um, and its efficacy in the therapy of allergic asthma. And this study quoted here looked at some of the biomarkers in this study that predicted a beneficial outcome to the use of omelizumab. <coughs> And what I direct your attention to is, in the center here, those that had greater numbers of eosinophils were the ones that were more likely to benefit by the use of omelizumab. So again, in a study not specifically targeted at eosinophils, but nevertheless pointing a strong finger to the role of eosinophils in the pathogenesis of allergic inflammation associated with asthma. So where in asthma do eosinophils play a role? Patients with an eosinophilic profile, either sputum eosinophilia or, or blood eosinophilia, despite ongoing treatment, would benefit. Patients with persistent eosinophilia, either in sputum um, or blood, and frequent uh, exacerbations. The mechanism by which eosinophils contribute to the exacerbation phenotype really have not been fully defined. So I think there is evolving uh, evidence for you know, some, at least some individuals benefiting by therapies that target eosinophils. And the benefits really that have been focused upon heretofore are the clinical benefits, as I mentioned, diminished uh, exa clinical ac exacerbations predominantly. I would think, though, we, we need to be thinking about I mean, even, even going a little bit further and begin to think about the role of eosinophils in chronic airway remodeling. And this is an unfortunate sample from an individual who died, an adult who died of status asthmaticus. And what we see in cross-section is the airway epithelium many eosinophils out in the airway, many more eosinophils beginning to uh, come into um, uh, the airway, some traversing through the air airway epithelium to end up in the sputum. But one of the notable uh, pathologic features of asthma is this thickened basement membrane. 
And this is a process that um, is not easily amenable to study or monitoring. Um, it's a one that would need you know rather deep biopsies to get at this, and it's a process that one would predict would have con contributed to the chronic morbidity associated with asthma. And should we, as we begin to think about the role of eosinophils in asthma, be thinking not just about clinical exacerbations, but we should we be thinking about the underlying pathology? of the airways in individuals with asthma. And I would go back to a paper that appeared um, from Barry Kay's group, it's the Journal of Clinical Investigation, um, and they looked at individuals who were received two doses of anti-IL-5 treatment. And then they did biopsies and analyses of um, uh, BAL fluid and could demonstrate that treating asthmatics with anti-IL-5 antibody, which diminishes airway eosinophils, significantly reduced the expression of tenacin, lumican, and pre-collagen in the bronchial mucosa uh, uh, basement membrane when compared with placebo. And in addition, anti-IL-5 treatment was associated with significant reduction in the numbers and percentage of airway eosinophils expressing mRNA for TGF-beta and the concentration of TGF-beta-1 in the BAL. So they concluded that eosinophils may contribute to tissue remodeling processes in asthma by regulating the deposition of extracellular matrix proteins. And I think that we have to keep this in mind. It's not an easily studied um, uh, uh, manifestation of asthma and, of, and manifestation of allergic inflammation. But I would think as we go forward and aim to target eosinophils potentially, we should be thinking about not just clinical exacerbations, but you know the role of the eosinophil in contributing cytokines, such as alluded to here, TGF beta one, that could be pro fibrogenic, um, because this may well have a, a role in the chronicity and of morbid and morbidity of asthma. Earlier studies have suggested that inhaled corticosteroids do not diminish or reverse some of this airway, the subepithelial uh, thickening, so that you know, therapies that might, such as something like this, uh, I, think, I think certainly merit attention. So I think in the last uh, 15, 20 years, we've come a long way in terms of understanding the eosinophil's role in asthma. It's more than just, quote, degranulating its, its, its cationic proteins. It's more than just liberating uh, uh, bronchospastic uh, eicosanoids, such as leukotriene C4. Certainly both of those can occur. Rather, I think there's an expanding role for the complexity of the eosinophil. What is degranulation? And so I think as we've indicated, it's not likely to be bombs away, everything gets, gets released at once. It's a deli more deliberate secretory process, and it's a process that involves not just the intact eosinophil, principally by means of piecemeal degranulation, but also involves uniquely the capacity of eosinophil granules liberated from the cell to continue to function um, extracellularly. So the eosinophil has you know, a diverse range of capabilities that can you know, impact the pathogenesis of asthma. And part of those diverse range of capabilities uh, are a consequence of all the cytokines that can be released from eosinophils. And in this cartoon prepared by Lisa Spencer and her colleagues, she's outlined some of the diverse activities associated with um, eosinophil-derived cytokines. And we've mentioned at the outset, you know, in a number of the, article, of the articles that are revealing unexpected activities of eosinophils, IL-4, functions in, in terms of uh, regenerating liver cells, IL-4 in terms of stimulating regeneration of muscle. The same thing is going to be true, I think, in terms of eosinophil contributions to airway disease. The, some of the fibrogenic uh, cytokines that can be derived from eosinophils may well be contributing to the changes in the subepithelium that one sees. Also, the capacity of eosinophils to interact with other cells, including lymphocytes and so on, um, may well be, be germane to the ongoing uh, process of allergic inflammation.
So I will close with that. I thank a large number of individuals who have worked uh, with uh, our group over the years and have contributed to this. Also, as I noted, I thank Bill Bussey for some of his, his slides because I did take questions. Chris? Thanks for a wonderful uh, both overview and sort of update on what's going on in eosinophil biology. Josh. So, uh, Peter, is, as usual, a beautiful presentation. Thank you. So I have, um, I guess, more of a comment than a question regarding the uh, uh, thickening of the lamina reticularis. Um, uh, I think the fly in the ointment about this phenomenon is that the people who have eosinophilic bronchitis and normal lung function also have this so-called remodeling. So my question to you is, um, how functionally important is it really? Um, and how much evidence is there that it relates to other adverse outcomes in people with severe asthma? Can I, can I answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is really twofold. How, how important is the subepithelial thickening and so on? Um, and the other was a, there was a related part of that question, right? Or was that the, the essence of it? Yeah, I mean, you see it in people with eosinophilic bronchitis, according to uh, Chris Breitling's work. Right. Um, people who have totally normal lung function. So I think it's probably related to the EO. The question is, does it relate to anything else functionally in people with severe asthma, or is it just a phenomenon that results from chronic eosinophilic inflammation, right. regardless of whether that's physiologic? I don't, I don't know that there's data that I'm aware of that would, would answer that question. I think it's, it's an excellent question. Um, in the one hand, when you begin to see the extent of the fibrosis and so on, you've got to think that it's got, and the fact that it's probably not easily reversible, it's got to have some impact, I would think, on you know airway function, um, but I'm not aware of you know specific measures that would um, you know address the, the nature of that impact. So, uh, do you have um, any? Could you comment at all on how you think the ethanol differentially regulates cytokine release out of the brain? So can I so can, can I comment? Can I comment? You know how how what do I what do I you know? What's happening, you know, yeah. in ter to how that EO is can, right. Cell biologically, I'm just curious, just really interesting piece of the talk that I actually really didn't appreciate. Well, I, 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 we don't, I don't think we have the definitive answer. Sure. What we've shown, and again, this is the work of Lisa Spencer and colleagues, is for IL-4, the IL-4 receptor is present in the granule. And actually, many of the receptors that we're talking about have very rich uh, stores in the granule. So if you go back to CCR3 and do staining of subcellular fractionation, the granules have those you know, cytokine or chemokine receptors. For IL-4, we've been able to provide evidence that when IL-4 is being secreted out of the EO, it's being carried by IL-4 receptor alpha chain. So the passage, the transport, is actually mediated, um, at least for IL-4, by binding to its cognate receptor. So that, but that takes us back one step, and then, then the question comes back, in you know, rephrasing your question is, how do the granules regulate what they load into vesicles? You know, if we, we say there, there are receptors there that may be carrying things in vesicles, you know, what happens in that loading stage? Studies with isolated granules, when you stimulate them, is a differential response. You know, even an isolated granule will put out, you know, they no IL-13, but more IL-6. So we don't, we don't know yet. And it's, it's going to be a vexing problem because none of the eosinophil cell lines have fully mature granules. And if the story, is, you know, exists in a granule, um, then we can't use cell lines. And um, Tali Shamri, who's in the audience, has put in a bunch of time and effort into looking at mouse eosinophils. Um, for many years, it was claimed that murine eosinophils don't degranulate in the same fashion that, eo that human eosinophils do. But Tali's now showing that they, that they do. So that may provide an avenue f to explore things more experimentally. <laughs>
Peter, um, I'd like to go back to the first part of your talk. I mean, I'm, I'm curious, why do we have a cynical? So if the cynicals are in mice, mice and human separated 65 to 85 million years ago, it seems, uh, in, it seems unbelievable that we would have kept this cell for 65 to 85 million years. As far as I'm aware, no human has been identified that lacks a cynical. Am I correct on that? No, the question is an excellent question. Evolutionarily, why do we have eosinophils? Okay, how far back in evolution do you go? Mass cells go back 500 million years. Probably, the eosinophils are probably the same. I mean, one of the problems with eosin what what's the signature of an eosinophil? Part of it's the EM signature, this granule with a crystalloid core. Well, you know, early some, some animals don't have that crystalloid core, so you, you lose that. I mean, you have some tinctorial properties. But EOs probably go back as, as far as mast cells. So it's really an element of an immune, innate immune system. And, you know, I think as some of the things that I cited in terms of eosinophil secreting cytokines acting on various other organs, liver, muscle, this data I didn't show in terms of uh, ductal de development in uh, developing breast in a female is, is eosinophil dependent in part. So I think eosinophils have a multitude of functions. Part of it may be that, you know, it is an innate immune cell. It's got this armamentarium of cytokine proteins that have diverse biological activities. In terms of humans, there are, pro there are a couple of case reports of individuals that nominally lack e eosinophils. Um, I'm not certain that they're all credible by contemporary standards. Nobody was measuring the eosinophil cationic proteins. They were just looking in the blood. And if blood numbers are, you know, normally three or four percent, you know, in a, on a Gaussian distribution, somebody's going to have, you know, beneath the level of detection, but maybe not absent. So um, you really probably are not in individuals who are eosinophil deficient. Can I do a follow-up with that? So, so in your pictures, in your slides, you show the cytokines in, in the grain. But really, what is the percent, or either molar or weight or what? I mean. I mean, I was, was told that, you know, this major basic protein, I mean, 99% of the granule was not cytokines. Is that, what is the status today in 2003? How much of the, of the granule protein is in total all cytokines compared to major basic protein and the other major percentage? That's an excellent question that, that curiously is somewhat difficult to answer experimentally. It is. It turns out to be very difficult to solubilize the the proteins in an eosinophil granule. So that you know, when the early work, when people talked about major basic protein being more than 50 percent of the protein, those granules were solubilized in acid in order to you know liberate all eight cationic proteins. So that you were, they were really comparing major basic protein with the other cationic proteins, not with some of these other, not with with cytokines. So. I, I don't have an easy answer for you on that. Can I uh, just uh, take one question from those who are participating by live webcast? And hi, Shamsa, for your participation. Dr. Kazani sent the following question. Do eosinophils generate exosomes, like uh, microvesicles or microparticles? And if so, how do they differ from the free circulating eosinophilic granules or the vesicles generated by piecemeal? granulation of eosinophils? That's an e excellent question. Uh, do eosinophils generate exosomes? And to our knowledge, no one really has looked at that as yet. We have some work, um, uh, Praveen Okathotos in, in the audience has begun to start, you know, evaluating that possibility. Um, but right now there isn't data on it. Yeah. So, beautiful presentation. I, I can't resist asking you about um, again, about the thickening of the lamina reticularis, because I think within the last two years, there was a report from a group in the UK, and perhaps Stephen Holgate's group, that suggested that bronchospasm alone, um, induced by methacholine and blocked by pretreatment with albuterol, as well as induction of bronchospasm with inhalation of dust mite antigen, um, which did bring eosinophilia as opposed to the methacholine, could induce the deposition of collagen in the airways. And so it seems like one contribution to 
sub-basement uh, membrane thickening involves the eosinophil, but maybe not entirely. And I wonder what mechanical forces might do to eosinophils. And as a kind of associated question, do you think that eosinophils, regardless of tissue context, meaning the blood, the airway, or the bone marrow, are they all the same? And are all dense granules all the same? Excellent questions as usual. Um, starting with, with the, the last questions in terms of are all eosinophils the same, are all granules the same? Um, at the present time, how does one address that? I mean, one can use a variety of different measures. One could do staining for, say, various proteins and you know, cytokines, whatever. Ask the question within an individual cell, are all the granules staining? When we've done that, all the granules seem to stain. So that would suggest, at least with the, the antibodies we've chosen to do the immunostaining, we're not detecting differences from one granule to another. And the same thing is true from one donor to another. I mean, there may be relative differences, and that's the importance of the data that I showed from Lisa, where we're looking at six different donors, and all of those cytokines were present. There may be slight differences in amounts. but So there's not an indication that there are, um, as yet, different populations of eosinophils. Um, might there be, in, in the same sense that macrophages are, you know, those are alternatively activated macrophages uh, with different biological activity than conventional macrophages? You know, might eosinophils convert themselves into an alternatively activated EO? I, I'll keep an open mind, but there's no data on it as yet. The first questions relate to, you know, some of the, the reported airway thickening, subepithelial thickening, developing with maybe mechanical forces um, and maybe being independent of eosinophils. To the extent that eosinophils often are found to a certain extent in the airway and that we really haven't looked at the effect of mechanical forces on the eosinophil itself. But, you know, there's an, I, it wouldn't, the two may not be independent. They, may, they still may be a link. That the mechanical forces um, may be contributing in some fashion to secretion from the eosinophil of pro-fibrotic cytokines. Not yet studied. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.